Hello, I'm Tom Moore from the Bar Titsa Lab, and in this particular video, I want to talk to you about asymmetric fighting. Now, asymmetric, or fighting asymmetrically, is about being one-sided. And obviously, if we're looking for martial arts, we're looking for self-defense, then it being one-sided in our favor is obviously a favorable goal. Excuse me. Now, one of the things that causes confusion for people transitioning into self-protection, self-defense style arts and practices is taking a tried and tested methodology, let's say boxing, and applying that to scenarios where you need to be asymmetric. Now, boxing by its very nature has amazing tools. It teaches you how to move your body, take a hit, give a hit, firing combinations, you know, all of that good stuff. And whether your eventual drill bit is the punch or the palm heel or the finger jab, you doing that in a boxing style way, using your hips, using your feet, using your shoulders, all of your mass, these are all very, very good things to do. But one of the things we need to divorce ourselves from is the cadence of sporting arts. We need to make our cadence, our timing, our approach asymmetric, one-sided. And so there are a couple of things that you need to be aware of. One of the first ones is if you take, say, a boxing principle art, and whether that's multi kickboxing, traditional boxing, whatever it may be, we typically work in combinations. So, you know, we move in combinations where it's one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, whatever you're going to do, typically you do it in a cluster and you fuck off and you move into something else. Using these arts for self-defense and self-protection, you need to train yourself to be a lot more asymmetric. It's always your turn. It's always your turn until there is no more turns to be taken and you can escape to safety. So some drills or some approaches to help divorce yourself from the very useful sporting skills and cadence into something that makes it very useful for self-defense, becoming more asymmetric. One of the first ones, and I think one of the most telling, is when we do combinations, typically we're on balance, okay? We're on balance. Whomp, whomp. We're on balance and we'll fire between two and four and five shots and then we'll stop and then we move obviously in these types of drills we need to get used to being able to continue the violence forward you know as many people say nose over toes moving in a predatory fashion we need to keep the violence smashing through the person and one of the things that is very, very important is changing the impetus from snapping star blows one two three into things that drive, occupying space. You want to be where he is now. And when he moves, you want to be where he is there again. You want to eviscerate him. You want to move through that man, which means the cadence of the blows moves away from one, two, three, into essentially what is called in many traditional arts, sticky hitting. Sticky hitting means that when I hit you, let's say I hit you with the left, the only thing that will replace that left is this right. Boom! As I smash through, I occupy the space where you used to be. Left, right. In our sporting cadence, in our more symmetrical cadence, we'll go bah, 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 and we'll whip him and we'll land some solid concussive damage, but we're not plowing through. It's okay, we can build that over rounds. If you've got a killer shot, it might cause a knockout but you've got time and space and opportunity to be a bit more symmetrical. If we're looking at asymmetric fighting, the first thing, and the first thing to wean yourself off from, is transactional blows. Things that hit and return, hit and return all the time. Always be driving through the opponent or have the mindset of driving through the opponent. And so for sticky hitting, uh, or muchimi, if you follow Japanese art, get used to being able to hit and only swap once you've hit with something else. Now that hit may be with your hand, maybe with your head, maybe with your elbow, maybe just bodily entering the space, but you're always swapping one bit of damage for another bit of damage. At no point is there the reset gap which this allows. When we work in combinations, when we're fighting symmetrically, when we're fighting sportingly, there's a little gap. There's always a little gap and both opponents unconsciously reset. They go, shit, I didn't want to get hit by that, or, oh, thank fuck, I blocked all of those. But there is essentially a mutually agreed, deep-rooted psychological pause and space 
in between flurries that we see in the useful sporting arts from which we take things. So to divorce ourselves from that, get used to being able to drive, drive, drive. It's more body mass, it's more force into the opponent. You're not sacrificing speed, I'm slowing it down here so you can see. So as opposed to, let's say a traditional one, two, one, two, we're going, yeah, the pressure stay on him until I swap with something else. That makes it more asymmetrical, makes it more about territorial gains as well. I'm gaining space, I'm crashing into you, I'm gaining essentially your ground. I'm disrupting your balance, making you go backwards. And if you're going backwards, if you're feeling defensive, I'm fucking winning. So again, changing your cadence from one, two, into one, two, two, the cadence is all about being one-sided and maintaining some degree of contact on the opponent and driving through him, no matter what we're doing. It's about being asymmetrical. Another thing, and you'll find this with traditional bare knuckle boxing and early Queensbury boxing, is one of the things that helps you use sporting arts more asymmetrically is the use of limited striking grappling. Now, in traditional boxing, we call this chancery. And there are a couple of different types. First chancery, very easily, it's just a single necktie over here. So elbow in line with his solar plexus, hand round either the top of his head or the back of his neck, depending on which sources you follow. And essentially, it's about ragging people in and hitting them. And it's about posting people off and hitting them. Obviously, if you post someone off, you do that ballistically, you smash them in the face, from here. And then you've got a long distance opportunity to fire your 16 inch guns what? or you rag them in take them off balance you apply some kazushi so you move them off balance and then you drive in your uppercuts your hooks your dirty boxing whatever you want to do but the use of chancery holding and hitting is a very important way because it changes your cadence as soon as you grab someone and start hitting them you're often a lot less pattern orientated when you're free and you're striking we tend to work in patterns because we hit mitts in patterns. Bom, bom. Bom, 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 bom. Bom, bom, bom. You move in a patterned way, which doesn't necessarily suit the asymmetric needs of real violence. So again, once we get a chancer in, our pattern tends to dissolve. We tend to move into what historically people call belaboring. So chancery is the old word for violently seizing an opponent. So for example, chancery number three in traditional bare knuckle boxing is essentially a side headlock where you'd smash their face in. You know, there are a couple of different chancery types, but the most common traditional chancery is hand around the back of the head. So you could post them and hit or rag them in and hit. Another note is that often a chancery will also be elbow crook. So as opposed to just hand, the elbow goes behind the head. So We've got this tight grip here, this vice-like grip, and then we smash in. So it's quite hard to hold onto a person that's resisting just with this grip here. If we do smash, as opposed to a full headlock or a full side chancery, we go for this modified front chancery where we end up here, pinching the head between our forearm and our bicep, and then we break the pattern. And this moves us away from pattern boxing to unpatterned. We can't do any fancy patterns here. Everything has to be asymmetric. So while you're holding, you're moving and you're hitting repeatedly until that becomes, essentially, he becomes non-threat. <laughs> You've got the ability to keep hitting in an unpredictable, unpatterned clusterfuck kind of way. You want to really ruin his day. So, as I mentioned, some of the things to break your combat sports symmetry to help you be more asymmetric is sticky hitting, replacing blows, and taking space as opposed to working in flurries and resets. Every time there's a reset, there's a chance for him to do something. If we work in a more sticky hitting or old school pugilistic fashion, we're swapping, we're swapping. So there's always something driving into his space and his face. Chancery, it's about concussively hitting and grabbing, deploying this chancery if you like, or any manner, making sure you're mixing up the posting, with the contracting, always moving them off balance, hit, hit, move, 
hit, hit, move, hit, hit, move. You know, you want to be making sure that he's always off balance as well as being hit, but make sure there is no real gap. You, know, you really are smashing in to that opponent using chancery to make sure you're being asymmetric. And another final point is adding more unorthodox tools to your arsenal. So it was easier to be an asymmetric boxer in the times where different parts of the hand were allowed to strike. So if I take the gloves off for a second, you know, traditional pugilism, you're striking with vertical fists. That was deemed safer at the time and there is good merit to argue that. But you've also got things called pivot blows. Pivot blows are sideways hammer fists. Bom, from here. And people historically have spun with those as well. Bam, from here. One of the few blows that knocked out Jack Dempsey. And because it knocked out Jack Dempsey, it was banned from the sport of boxing. Pivot blows, sideways hammer fists. You've also then got chopper blows. Chopper blows made famous by Mendoza, a very famous early British bare knuckle boxer, using these two knuckles here, smashing down in a back fist like format. <laughs> Typically coming after an elbow cover. So you've got traditional pugilistic methods there. So pivot blows, chopper blows, and hammer blows. So what you can do is once you gain awareness of the more unorthodox type of strikes, you can hit on half beats. So as opposed to waiting for the traditional combinations of bam, 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 and a reset, you can add in more incidental unorthodox blows. So for example, you might go hook, pivot blow, lead. <laughs> At no point there is the man given the space to essentially get himself composed to respond to counter attack. So using those incidental blows in traditional boxing, let's say we're just going hook and step off and jab for this instance. <laughs> There is a small gap between this and this that allows him to attack me. When I go bang, pivot, bang, I'm adding an offbeat, concussive, powerful shot. Now it's not gonna be as powerful as the hook or the lead off, but what it is going to do is cause him damage. It's gonna feel like he's in a tumble jar with a brick. Every single movement is gonna hurt. So again, adding in those incidental shots, hook, chopper straight you might go hook pivot blow straight you might go pivot straight pivot and you've got the ways to throw in these incidental half beat shots and that allows you to be more asymmetric <laughs> it fills in gaps it fills in time you know it's a bit like the old uh, college professor analogy where a man falls, fills up a jar with ball bearings. And he says to the students, is the jar full? And they say, yes. And then he pours in a load of sand. And he goes to the students, is the jar now full? And they go, yes, obviously, you can see it. And then he opens the jar again, he pours in water. So the student thought that the jar was full with the ball bearings. Then they could see that sand gets in the cracks. Then they could see that water gets in between that sand. So it's a bit like striking, where you've got small space. <laughs> What could I do to fill that space? So again, it's all about just testing, learning, experimenting. But if you want to make your pugilism a little bit more asymmetric for self-defense, again, some of the methods, sticky hitting, hit and punch to retract, don't retract on its own. And making sure you're driving nose over toes, body weight, drop stepping, moving through the opponent making sure you get make good solid use of chancery so holding and hitting so you can move in a non-patented way and you can strike in a way that offers different types of pattern and thirdly making sure you break up your cadence by adding incidental striking in betwixt your combinations straight pivot straight chopper straight finding those ways to hit on a half beat are really good ways to fill what may seem like a small vacuum of time when you're doing it on the pads, in the scope of a real fight, that can feel like an awful lot of opportunity for someone to throw a spazzy punch back at you. If you're filling and tightening all your gaps with other strikes too, that's another way to make your pugilism a lot more asymmetrical and therefore a bit sounder for self-defense.